Good evening, good evening. I'm delighted you're able to join CMI tonight for our celebration of apprenticeships in National Apprenticeship Week 2023. Whether you're in the room or joining us virtually, um, we've got a stunning agenda uh, for you filled with extraordinary speakers. Um, CMI believes that management apprenticeships are a vital part of the UK skills uh, environment and well worth celebrating. Uh, this year, we will proudly uh, assess and accredit 10,000 apprentices. And let me underline proudly. Um, the positive impacts they deliver are both for the learner through widening opportunities and developing sought after skills and for the employer uh, in terms of delivering high quality employer led skills and behaviours. Um, I won't say any more now as I know we're going to explore these positive impacts in much more detail. Um, but before I hand you over, I just want to encourage you to join the conversation online tonight with the hashtag CMI Apprenticeships. Um, you'll have noticed our Twitter wall uh, next to the stage. Uh, let us know what you think throughout the night, what points from our speakers particularly resonate, and how do you think we should spread the word more widely about the positive impacts of apprenticeships. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand you to CMI's Chief Executive, uh, Anne Franca, for the first session of our evening. Welcome, Anne. Thank you. <laughs> so, our next speaker also needs no real introduction, but I am absolutely delighted to welcome um, Gillian Keegan, the Secretary of State for Education. She is a, a very vocal champion of apprenticeships, um, and she's previously been co-chair of the parliamentary group, or the all-party parliamentary group of apprenticeships, as well as Minister for Apprenticeships and Skills in the Department of Education. She is also the only degree apprentice in the parliament, and I know she's doing everything within her power to ensure that she is just the first of many. So please welcome now, it's my great honor, the Secretary of State, Gillian Keegan. Hello, hello, and uh, thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome, Anne, and, and thank you for your inspiring words, Your Royal Highness. Um, I thought I'd talk today, as we're here at the CMI, about uh, apprenticeships and leadership as well. Um, and it goes back a little bit to what you said about the stereotypes and busting some of the stereotypes um, of uh, apprentices and where an apprenticeship can lead you. Um, so in terms of leadership, I think we saw the best current example of leadership this week in the UK as President Zelensky addressed the UK Parliament in Westminster Hall, uh, where you could hear a pin drop. And leaders are called on to perform many, many tasks, but it's a time in crisis when you really see their worth. Um, we certainly see that uh, in Ukraine at the moment. And it got me thinking more about leadership, and particularly in crisis. We've been through a fair few crises as a country, the pandemic, lots of people stepped forward in leadership positions. I was very young when I first saw inspiring leadership in action. Alfred Sloan, which some of you may uh, be aware of was a guru of leadership in the in the American business executive in the in the 40s and 50s and he'd been the chief executive of General Motors and that was the company that I joined as an apprentice when I was 16 and I learned firsthand because a lot of the legacy even though it was 30 years later um, with how he'd grappled with the huge impact that change in technology had on the car industry how he'd totally have to overhaul, overhaul management structures and come up with ways to future-proof the business, to look at really process engineering and how strong leadership at all levels was the only way and indeed the best way to deliver this. And he famously said that staying at the top is often harder than getting there. Well, I can safely say as a politician now, that is definitely true. Um, now, there were very, uh, all very valuable lessons in life. And my life went full circle in a way when later on I continued my lifelong learning um, thanks to a Sloan Fellowship named indeed after Alfred Sloan at London Business School. So Alfred Sloan's legacy didn't only guide me during my own apprenticeship at General Motors, but his principles of leadership have actually followed me throughout my career, and I still use them to this day. Now, I've often spoken about how my apprenticeship growing up in Knowsley in Merseyside was actually a golden ticket 
I was with a group of apprentices in number 10 today. And one of the things they were saying, I was sort of asking what the barriers were. And they said it was basically their parents not thinking it was the right route for them. And I thought, gosh, in Knowsley, everybody competed massively to get a, an apprenticeship. It was the golden ticket. The alternatives were a YTS or just a job. Uh, not really university at that time. It was a long, long time ago. Uh, and I do worry about people who are going to university now, perhaps not onto the best course for them, not on the best quality courses. And I guarantee, um, you know, there'll be many people who perhaps don't have a real understanding of what they need to study and where it's going to get them in life. And we need to do a better job of that. And careers is a, a part of that as well. But my apprenticeship, not um, it, it gave me an introduction into how a business works, uh, how a whole business works. I went around the whole business for three years. And uh, in, in fact, at the end of it, there was only a few of us who actually knew how the whole thing knitted together, which were the apprentices and uh, I think the CEO and the CFO. Um, but it laid solid foundations and it embedded the principles of good leadership. And, and I wouldn't be standing here today without the foundations from that apprenticeship. In fact, ITV, I went back up to see my parents in Liverpool um, at the weekend because I was going to Camel Laird with Ben Wallace, the uh, Defence Secretary, and uh, ITV decided to follow me with a camera because they wanted to see the only apprentice um, and <laughs> wanted to see uh, the school I'd gone to, which is closed down, the factory I'd gone to, which is closed down. So we stood outside a lot of gates uh, in Knowsley <laughs> saying this was the building. Uh, it used to be there. Um, but, you know, it really, nothing matters more to me um, than making sure that everyone, wherever they grew up, uh, gets the best chance to be the best version of themselves. And not only from a young person, but acquiring new skills are vital at every step of our lives. And the more we can prepare young people and re-prepare uh, people as they're getting older, the more resilient we'll be when the next crisis come, comes along. Because sooner or later, it will. That's one thing you know um, about uh, events. You know, they, 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 it will happen and we will have to face uh, difficult um times in the future, which is when leadership is absolutely critical. Uh, hopefully no one will have to face one as grave as President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people, but there will we will have to manage crisis in our business life, um, whether that's because of disrupted supply chains, a global pandemic that no one saw coming, or there'll be other things as well. Um, so I'd like to congratulate the CMI actually for spreading the message about uh, the importance of leadership skills and good management and readiness and resilience. Uh, you do a fantastic job of that. Now, employers, going back to uh, the Countess's point, employers have been complaining for years that people are turning up without the right skills for the jobs that they need, that's needed to be done. And this can be with or without a degree. Um, apprenticeships, I think, are one of the best means we have of making sure that skills and jobs match. It is the holy grail of business to get the education system to be working better with um, the businesses and employers. Um, and what we've been doing since 2012 is actually working with employers um, because the, the employers are constantly evolving and adapting. They're always at the forefront of technological change. Education won't keep up with that. Research can, but education, when it comes to provision, uh, it's difficult to do that. So we've been working with 5,000 employers since 2012 to build the apprenticeship standards in pretty much anything. When I was the apprenticeships and skills minister, the last one I personally signed off was a space engineer, which enabled me to say every time since, there's no way you cannot go without an apprenticeship. Um, but one of the things that I'm working hard to change is the view that an apprenticeship is just about hard hats or high vis jackets. In every now, there, there are many, many apprenticeships which will lead to careers where you have to wear a hard hat and a high vis jacket. But the reason I want to take them out of pretty much everything is because everyone knows that. That's the stereotype. That's what everyone knows already. We need to challenge that because there are a huge range of apprenticeships that we have in this country. I think 659 different career routes from degree apprentices at Goldman Sachs. I met some of them today to apprentice stage technicians at the Royal Shakespeare Company, to accountants, to lawyers, to get this, the new one we've just started, doctors. We will now have a doctor's apprenticeship, which is a five-year apprenticeship, uh, 100 starting next year, 100 starting the year after. So given this is National Apprenticeship Week, so let's look at some of the numbers. 92% of apprentices who complete their training go into work or further training, and 90% in sustained employment. There's no other figures like it. 85% feel their career prospects have improved since they started. They have, 
largely because they've started. Once you start, you do improve your career prospects. The most difficult thing normally is getting started. 78% uh, of apprentice employers identify increased productivity from training. And these are the kind of numbers that are going to boost the economy, as well as what the Countess was saying about the earnings and the earning potentials. And I think some of the research that you were talking about, which backs up that actually is a really good route into fantastic careers. So I'm delighted the CMI has its own chartered management degree apprenticeship for anyone in business who's responsible for delivering successful projects or operations or has the ambition or talent to be a future leader because apprentices will be the future leaders. They, they get a head start, they're learning on the business, they're transferring knowledge, which is an invaluable way to work from a fast moving business and having the structure of whatever qualification you're doing. And there's something about the way that you're taught as an apprentice, that constant lifelong learning, how you address how you get from A to B. When I first decided after a long 30 year business career, in fact, I met somebody here who's come up to me and said hello, who used to work with me when I worked in Madrid for eight years. <laughs> so um, it's funny how life uh, comes around. Um, but it, it, it's, it's really, really important that people know how to, how to, how to how to get on and, and how to, to, to get started. And it really is about making sure that there are lots and lots of high quality uh, apprenticeship routes. Um, and it, it's really the only way that we're going to make sure that business and education really is uh, combined and is really fast moving and always evolving. There's many uh, organizations. The NHS takes advantage of apprenticeships now. I just talked about doctors, John Lewis, Rolls-Royce, many, many large companies. SMEs is where it's more difficult. And that's where we really need to work more collaboratively. But we have routes that we're starting to work on now, Pathfinder routes and working with the local mayor, combined authorities, um, employer responsible businesses, a lot of effort to really get that down at the local level. But the huge priority for me is to make sure that people can improve their lot at any age and at any stage in life so that our skills agenda is, is firmly focused on lifelong learning. That's coming next. We've got a lifelong learning entitlement so that it's not just young people who get the chance to get loans to be able to uh, further their education. And we'll look at how flexible that can be. We've got T-levels coming. These are fantastic routes, alternative routes, which are a perfect fit for a higher level apprenticeship. They're coming in many things, accounting, digital, business admin, finance, accountancy, legal, almost any career. And this is the stereotype that we need to break and the knowledge that we need to gain. You can get to any career pretty much via an apprenticeship now. So for me, this is a really exciting time for our country. I was really delighted to start the journey as the Apprenticeship and Skills Minister, even more delighted, I must say, to come back as the uh, Secretary of State um, and all the things that I got overruled on last time, including a teacher apprenticeship. Uh, I, I, uh, I now feel more excited that I might actually get my, uh, my ideas uh, put into practice. But I, I, am, I fully get this agenda, not only because I was an apprentice, not only because it gave me my lifelong opportunity, not only because I worked for 30 years in business and I recruited lots of people, but also because I know the power of how you get from one place to another uh, using this lifelong learning. This It's a modus operandi. It's the way that you tackle every problem. When I decided I was going to try and become an MP, which was a bit of an irrational decision, I'm sure, but uh, not many people do that from the business world. I, I didn't know how to go about it. Um, so I designed my own apprenticeship. I sat down and write my own apprenticeship. All the things I didn't know. I didn't know anything about the NHS. I need to go on the board of governors. I didn't know anything about public service. I need to become a local councillor. I didn't know anyone in parliament. I need to do something in parliament. And I basically put it all together so that I could get my way from being in business to engineer. And it was exactly the same mentality. There was no qualification, but uh, I, I used it to gain the experience. So it is an exciting time for our country. We are shifting up several gears in how we approach education and training post 16. And, you know, my apprenticeship was a turning point in life and it shaped my entire career. And I want everyone to have the same opportunity wherever they are in the country. And we talk about leveling up and I want them to have their own golden ticket to take them as far as they can go and as fast as they want to go. Thank you. So thank you, Secretary of State uh, Gillian, for those really inspiring words. I love the notion, by the way, of an apprenticeship for MPs. I think that would be quite good. 
And I'm so glad um, that, you, that you did your own. Perhaps we could formalize that. Um, but you mentioned apprentices are for every stage and age, um, covering all things. And what we're going to do now, and I'm delighted that you're staying for this, um, Jillian, is we're going to talk to some apprentices. So they're going to make their way to the stage now. I'd like to invite um, Sally and uh, Julia and Paige to join us. And um, Secretary of State, if you would mind coming back and taking a seat. And we're going to just hear from some apprentices and they're going to share some of our experiences. Um, yeah, you can sit wherever you're comfortable, that's fine. So we've got, um, I would ask the apprentices as they come and once you've sat down, if you don't mind, <laughs> just very briefly, your um, name, hi. what apprenticeship you're doing um, or, or did your employer um, and your job title if, if, if relevant. And I'll start with you, Sally. Okay, my name's Sally Bristow and I work for a company called Diamond Hard Surfaces. We're a micro SME, which means we employ less than 10 um, people in our business and we're in engineering. And the um, apprenticeship that I did was a management and leadership apprenticeship with international trade. Brilliant, thank Excellent. you. Julia. Hi there, so my name is Julia Jones. I work for the John Lewis Partnership. Hi there. Hi. Um, and I undertook the Level 2 Intermediate LGV Driver Apprenticeship. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. And Paige? Hi, I'm Paige Morgan. I'm from TfL and I undertook the Chartered Management Degree Apprenticeship and I did a Level 6 Management Business Degree. Brilliant. And you're now in customer service? Um, I've now started a new role um, last week as a trains manager, so I now run a depot. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, well, let me start with you, Sally. You featured as a case study in our research. Um, could you just tell us just a little bit about the impact you've had in your organization, your micro SME, and what skills you learned in your apprenticeship that helped you to deliver that impact? So um, I'm very fortunate that working in a small business, I get to um, be involved in all areas of the business. So I have to wear many hats. What I did realize is that in wearing all of those hats, I didn't necessarily have the knowledge that I needed. Um, didn't mean that we didn't have the knowledge in the business, we did. I just felt that personally, I needed more confidence and I needed a a more grounded um, point of reference in my knowledge. So by doing the apprenticeship and by starting with the Institute of Export, which is where I did my foundation degree, um, I was given the skills to be able to come to the business um, strategic planning when we were looking at leaving the EU. So we had to prepare ourselves for that, um, for whatever that was going to bring, whatever challenges we may face, because we import and export to 22 different countries and we deal with big blue chip companies. So we needed to be prepared for that, which is why I decided to um, take on the apprenticeship through the Institute of Export and then went on to do my management through um, Plymouth University. Mm -hmm. And what were the results for your organization? I think they were quite special, what you then achieved. Yeah, so right at the end of um, my learning with the Institute of Export, I had to deliver a project. And my project um, in collaboration with the company was to look at whether, um, how we could best serve our global customers with, um, leaving the EU looming. So we looked at um, the um, authorised economic operator status that might help us get through things through customs quickly. And I realised when I did that project that in actual, in actual fact that wasn't for us. A better route was to go down um, the um, inward processing route and that would save us money um, in the long run and would get the goods through customs quicker. And what happened to the business? We grew um, by 60% and that was during the pandemic because obviously what we didn't plan for was um, a pandemic. 
and um, we grew the business by 60% in international trade and we have um, won the Queen's Award last year for international trade. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> That's an amazing impact story, isn't mm -hmm. it? And, um, uh, and also from one of those SMEs, so an inspiration for all SMEs. Um, now, Julia, let me come to you. You followed your passion and retrained as an LGV driver. Um, was that a career that was suggested to you when you were younger? And, and how have people responded to you doing that? Um, so not directly, no. So uh, the way it came about is um, when I was a child, I was very lucky and I had the opportunity to live in the Caribbean for a few years uh, due to my dad's job as an executive chef at one of the hotels. And uh, one, in, one of his many responsibilities was to drive the trucks to the airport for uh, loading all the meals onto the aeroplanes. And I used to accompany him on occasion. And uh, that's when I fell in love with the idea of uh, driving a big truck, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, when I tell my friends and uh, co-workers that I... I'm an LGV driver on the apprenticeship program. Um, they are quite shocked because of my maturing years. Um, when you hear the word apprentice, you do associate it with someone of a much younger age. Uh, but after the shock level, they're very happy for me and uh, <laughs> fully support me. <laughs> and what made you decide that now's the time to become a, a lorry driver? <laughs> uh, so to be fair, uh, I've always wanted to be a lorry driver, as I said, from a very young age. And life just happens, gets in the way, as it invariably does. And one thing came to another. I just took a different career path. Um, and then a few years ago, my life circumstances did change. And then I was just perusing the John Lewis internal job boards. And I saw they were advertising for an apprentice LGB driver. And I just couldn't believe my luck. So I just <laughs> had to reply. And uh, thanks to my now manager, Simon Dixon, he very uh, thankfully took me on. And here I am now. Well, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Great. And and. You know, we talk about getting more um, older workers back into the workforce and how much we need them. Um, what would you say to employers about, um, you know, people like yourself that maybe want to retrain to do some of these, these jobs where we have these skills gaps? How could we get them to wake up to this fact? So I think a, a good idea would be to put them in touch with existing apprentices who have actually gone through the program themselves um, and perhaps help mentor them. So I've been very lucky. I've been asked uh, because I'm an LGV driver apprentice and uh, I've been asked to actually mentor other apprentices coming through the program. So I think that's a good way of actually introducing others to the programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, now, Paige. Paige is one of the faces of CMI's first ever brand campaign, which is all about career confidence. Yep. Um, and uh, maybe you can share with us, um, how did your apprenticeship affect your confidence um, and your life skills and your sense of the opportunities more broadly? So the apprenticeship had a major impact on my confidence. Um, once I went through the program, I found my biggest lesson that I learned while doing the degree apprenticeship was that there's a massive difference between being a leader and a manager. Um, you can be a great lead manager, but you can be a very poor leader. So you have to know how to lead a team as well as manage them. Um, so I applied them skills into my everyday job and I went for a job that I would have never thought I would have gone for when I first started at TFL. And here I am a year later, I've now left that job and I've now been promoted to a job that I never thought I'd be in five years ago. Um, and everything I've learned whilst doing the degree apprenticeship, I applied um, to my everyday life. So I'm more motivated because I'm excelling in my career. I'm more motivated to do things in my personal life. And I also started a business and I can apply everything I learned there into my business. And the opportunities from doing apprenticeship was just amazing. And I would definitely recommend it. Well, that's an incredibly impressive story. And um, we touched on earlier with, with the Countess that, um, you know, university isn't for everyone. Um, and I know for you, you felt that quite strongly that it wasn't for you. And um, how do you think the um, um, apprenticeship um, route came about for you? And how easy or difficult was it for you to head down that route? What stimulated you to do that? Um, so I'd say around 
10 years ago when I was leaving school. Oh, goodness, I'm old, 10 years ago. <laughs> I just thought about that. Um, I knew for sure I did not want to go to uni. Um, all my friends were doing their UCAS application. I submitted mine the morning of because I just thought uni is not for me. Once leaving school, I did not go to university. I did a level four apprenticeship um, in an accountancy firm. And then I was just looking for something new. I did that for two years and then I saw a degree apprenticeship. So although I didn't want to go to university, this opportunity did come around and I took it with open arms because I'm gaining the experience whilst working. And it's investment. They invested in me in for how many years? Four years. And also I got a job at the end of it. So and it wasn't easy to do the four years, but definitely rewarding and definitely worth it. And and what did your friends that were doing all their university applications um you know what do they what do they say about your route versus their route do you ever connect with them on that yeah i do so at first in school even my teachers thought i was crazy because university was the route if you wanted to be successful and now many of them are stuck in the career path that they necessarily can't get out of because their degree is just literally focused and pinned to that one career. Um, but now I tell them about apprenticeships and you can do it one for a year, you could do one for four years. And as um, you said, five years, now they're more intrigued. And I've had a friend recently start an apprenticeship. Um, so Jillian, you, we've heard some very interesting mm. things here. Um, so what are your priorities for encouraging more businesses to take on more apprentices? Well, first of all, just before that, we actually put um, all of the apprenticeships, that was the announcement this week during the apprenticeship week, on the UCAS site. So anybody now going on UCAS can now look at all the apprenticeship options as well. And we're going to put more and more information about all the various routes, the T-levels, where that can take you. So there's just more or better information at the time when you're starting to think about it. Um, but in terms of uh, more businesses, I mean, I think a lot of businesses, a larger businesses have really got into this. So you look at sort of big employers, so, you know, they're, they're now training thousands. I mean, there's many employers now that are taking degree apprenticeships over graduate schemes. And one of them said to me, he said, Gillian, what, have you, I, I can't work out why the degree apprentices are doing better than the graduates when they've got less time. I said, oh, that's really simple. I said, the degree apprentices know that you're looking at everything they do, whether they've turned up every mark they've got, every exam they've done. So, and, and when your person who's paying you is looking at that level of insight into you, you want to show that you can, uh, you can perform. So that's very simple. Um, but I think the, the, the challenge now is to get more and more of the smaller employers. And that's where we have to, we've got these pathfinders, which we're working on to try and go out and literally find them um, and then work with them and look for great examples. I mean, you know, Sally's a brilliant example of, of how with that apprenticeship, with that extra knowledge, you can transform a business through you know again knowing how to lead through things that you you didn't know were going to happen necessarily but you can have a massive impact particularly on a small business a massive impact so that's what we'll be doing um, and we're also working the skills act which passed last year was really focused on getting these um, employer representative bodies to work with the local colleges and and iot's and universities to really make sure that we match, you know, we sit there and say about the NHS, you know, we've got the shortage of people. Like what shortage have we got, right? Occupational therapists, we've got physiotherapists, we've got um, nurses, we've got this type of uh, dementia nurse, we've got this, the workforce plan, we need to populate that then with apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. um, so, because actually apprentices are starting work from the get-go. I mean, they're not fully qualified, but they're there and they're productive starting work from the get-go. So it's a really good way, and Steve Barkley and myself are working on you know, a task and finish group to sort of figure out what we can do more and more to, um, to, to encourage that. I mean, there are many apprenticeships, but we need to just scale everything up. And that's really the challenge that we've got now. But the small and medium sized businesses through the employee representative organizations and uh, working with the local mayors, et cetera, is, is really the focus we're putting on that. Yes, and, and uh, we know that that's a key focus, and Sally is an excellent positive story yeah. in that regard. And I know that, uh, right. that at, at CMI we're working with some of those business representative groups to yeah. figure out how can we target small businesses better. Um, but just by way of conclusion, Jillian, um, what jumped out of you from what our wonderful panel of very diverse apprentices at every age and stage, what they shared with you tonight, what are some of your key takeaways? I mean, the breadth of um, how apprenticeships can solve the problem. Sally um, has turned a, a business challenge into a business opportunity through your increased knowledge. Julie's had her 
lifelong dream realized um, for something that you want to do. And Paige is um, much further ahead than probably most of her friends, um, really pioneering. And I'm sure all of you will be uh, great examples, great adverts and great leaders of the future. And I look forward to and it and just makes you really proud, doesn't it? This is what everyone thinks. This is what I think you were saying. Every time you meet all the apprentices, you think, wow, because there's so much more. I mean, mature, you are 10 years older, but, you know, I'm sure you were <laughs> quite mature from the beginning of your apprenticeship as well, because you're just learning all the time. So I think it just shows in action how fantastic apprenticeships are and how they can solve many problems and fulfill many dreams. Brilliant. A golden ticket indeed, as you said. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, you. Jillian, Secretary of State, our brilliant panelists, Sally and Julia and Paige. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening and sharing all of your inspiring stories and thoughts. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Anne. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm now handing back to Anthony Painter, who's going to uh, uh, run a panel with the employer view on what we can do to get more apprenticeships. Anthony. Thank you. If I can um, call up uh, James, uh, Stuart, Kath, and uh, Heather. Sorry. Sorry. Our um, apprentice panel, incredibly inspiring stories from um, Paige, Julia and, uh, and, and Sally there. Um, and I'd like to introduce our next panel, um, which is on uh, apprenticeships, taking social mobility um, further. Um, we've heard about the sort of positive impacts that apprentices can have on their employer, on their businesses. It's something we found in uh, our report for the end of last year, the future of the apprenticeship levy, um, that there are still stunning returns on investment um, in uh, apprentices. We saw sort of three times the amount in terms of productivity over the initial investment on apprenticeships spread over a 10 year, 10 year period. But we also found um, that um, apprenticeships are increasingly an aid to social mobility and diversity and inclusion. So for example, 71% of management apprenticeships come from families where neither parent has been to university. 39% come from our apprentices are from lower socioeconomic uh, backgrounds compared to 36% in UK labour force and 27% in higher education. And I think this is why increasingly people are turning to degree apprenticeships as not just an alternative to, to traditional degrees, but in some respects preferable um, to them. Uh, and in fact, we're going to release some survey findings in the next few days that show our managers are considerably more likely to think a degree apprenticeship is the right route over a traditional degree. And this really flips things over the past um, few years. So on this panel, we're gonna hear from some fantastic employers um, and education institution and training providers who are championing, championing apprenticeships and recognizing their ability to widen uh, access and opportunity. And I'm just gonna go down the panel and ask you to introduce yourselves and I'll start off with Heather. Good evening, everybody. My name is Heather Melville, and I'm a senior managing director at a global headhunting firm, um, Taneo. But I'm also recently appointed as chancellor of York University, so I have a very invested interest in this topic. Thank you. Have Good evening, everybody. I'm Catherine Austin. I'm very proud to be the chair of CMI Wells, um, and I also am the chief marketing and people officer of Pizza Hut restaurants in the UK and also the headmistress for Pizza Hut restaurants. <laughs> te <laughs> technically, I run our, our employer provider programme, so uh, that's the favourite bit of my job. <laughs> James. So I'm uh, James Kelly. I'm the chief executive and co-founder of Corndell, and we are currently privileged to be supporting over 5,000 apprentices with a range of different companies. Stuart. I'm Stuart Brocklehurst. Uh, I run a technology business working on artificial intelligence, uh, which I sold last year, and I couldn't have done it without degree apprentices. Ah, there we are. Fantastic. And we'll come on to that in the conversation. Heather, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, over the past few years, there's been a lot of conversation around the big four really starting to embrace uh, apprenticeships to think about the sort of social mobility aspects of their teams and their futures. What do you think is driving that thinking? And do you think it's going to have a lasting impact um, in some of the larger professional services firms? So I think the, the important thing is, is that organisations need to harness and get the best talent. 
And one of the things that we realize is if you have the same people from the same backgrounds making the same decisions, you get the same outcome. Yeah. Um, and, and where we have seen a shift is where you've had some really talented people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different educational backgrounds come into organizations and bring that diversity of thought and ideas to the table, which actually trigger businesses to think differently. Yeah. And the other thing for me around is how you create that working environment where everybody can be their best and have the opportunities to be their best. And I think organisations who are really trying to get into their communities realise that they have got to invest in the whole apprentice scheme as yes. well. Yeah, uh, it, it's something we found um, in our Everyone Economy uh, research last, last year. It's not just that... Um, uh, equality, diversity and inclusion are important in and of themselves because of course they are but they are also heavily linked to organisational performance, success, effectiveness, innovation um, and so on. It's kind of a relentless finding which is, um, which is, which is critical. Catherine, what is um, Peter Hutt doing to widen the social backgrounds of his teams and, and what do you think your efforts will look like in the future? So we made the decision oh, about five, six years ago now to actually bring our entry-level apprenticeships in-house um, so we deliver our level two front and back of house, level threes up to level four, and then we partner five, six, seven, seven. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we literally, I would say 90% of our level twos would be categorized as NEETs before they join us and not an employment educational training. Um, and most of them have had quite an up, I mean, unstructured upbringing. Um, usually they've dropped out of school or they've been you know, moved around. Um, so our first job is to get them through foundation skills for English and math, um, which can be quite daunting um, for those students, those learners. Um, but again, we find all the things that you've been talking about, which is if you can get them through the first couple of hurdles, you can then keep them and take them through level three, level four and up. Um, so we've got some tremendous examples of people that started with us literally with no qualifications at all. And in fact, one of them, a lovely girl called Lexi, when I first met her, when we talk about confidence, she wouldn't make eye contact. She literally wouldn't, you know, she just didn't have the ability to do that. Um, and now she's actually one of our apprenticeship trainers. So she actually trains our apprenticeships, <laughs> our apprentices. So um, she's a great example. And she's doing her charter manager now, actually. So she's do, doing her level five now. So. What was it that made Pizza Hut really invest in this and and really really take it on as a you know, as, as a provider as well as an, em, an employer bringing in apprentices? Well, I think any, anyone that knows me knows I bang on about hospitality is a brilliant place to learn <laughs> skills, um, and I think this is absolutely true. I mean, the world of hospitality is really diverse, um, and it's a sector where really really quickly you can actually be running a multi-million pound business, looking after everything from marketing to management to supply chain to you know, every every part of the business you can imagine. And um, I think it's often overlooked as a career choice. So actually providing apprenticeships at that entry level um, enables you to you know, empower social mobility, but at the same time actually create career paths. So I think we have to work harder. We have to take more people in at the lower levels and then bring them through and up. And that's what we try to do. It sounds like the company really lent into the challenge, right? Just complaining about skills gaps, actually reached out and tried to do things a bit yeah, differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, James, what is it about apprenticeships that make them such a valuable tool for social mobility, do you think? And, and also, you know, thinking about the future of the, 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 the levy, the apprenticeship system and so on, is there anything we need to do to really supercharge what they can do to provide more access points? I think kind of on the social mobility thing, I think one of the things which um, may be a bit controversially, but I think we have a risk of we're teaching exams, people to pass exams rather than gain skills. And when we constantly talk to employers, they want people to have interpersonal skills, team working skills, communication <coughs> skills, human capital skills. And I think it's really ironic that we have very expensive fee paying schools that spend a fortune helping young people gain those interpersonal skills and through apprenticeships we have the ability to build all of those I'm not going to call them soft skills power skills skills that really enable you to progress and get on and work with people and it's again paradoxically younger generation the most connected through technology but almost the least connected on a people basis and I think apprenticeships can really give people the people skills to do that and then I think secondly is we've heard a lot about apprenticeships and confidence and confidence. And one of those things that, you know, kind of makes you just feel good about your job. I remember we got a, 
an email in from a lady who had done one of our level three management programs. She had left school at 16, she had completed this. She was so proud and so confident. And on the way, she had actually done a maths qualification she had to do as part of her apprenticeship. And she said, I feel so much more confident. I've also got my maths um, qualification and I can think I can help my daughter with her homework. Mm -hmm. and it was just one of those moments where you think, that is social mobility at its most powerful. Um, and in things of, I think, where government uh, could maybe look at is all those people skills um, I talk about, whether it's at school or university and apprenticeships, they should be core to the curriculum. And they should be core to the curriculum because employers want them from a productivity thing. We've got a whole load of mental health issues in the country where people can't communicate which we need to get right. And secondly, they give people that confidence. And confidence is what drives mobility. So I, I think it's a great opportunity to be seized. Some of these skills that you're describing are often sort of called sort of soft skills and things, things like that, which I always think sounds rather dismissive because it's, it's actually heavily structured. And within an apprenticeship, obviously, it's designed in to be tested in, in context, in an environment, um, in a way that demonstrates that you have them and you can make a difference through having those skills. We need a different way of describing it, don't we? Yeah, I kind of am. Um, but what is absolutely true from the employers we're working with, this is what people want at the moment. Yes. We've got this real deficit of people coming out of university who don't know how to behave in a meeting room. Or we have people at school who just are terrified of putting their hand up to speak. And that's the system isn't working if that's happening. And apprenticeship should really be a change point for that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Stuart, for, for the last decade, you've, you've run a, a tech business in um, perhaps what, one of the more rural regions of the, of the country. I don't know whether it's fair to describe it as that. And I'm just kind of interesting, interested from a sort of levelling up perspective. You know, how does the role played by apprenticeships differ in, in, in settings that are sort of you know, more like the southwest, perhaps? So apprenticeships have an outsized role to play in more peripheral parts of the country. In North Devon, we have half the proportion of school leavers going to university that you'd have here in central London. And that is not because our young people are thick. No. Uh, you tend to think of deprivation as being gritty inner cities, but the English district out of 315 that regist registers highest on indices of multiple deprivation is West Somerset, just the neighboring district to myself. And deprivation um, brings with it you know, health issues, various different challenges. It's amazing the number of apprentices I recruit who are carers for parents or grandparents with serious health problems. They can't move away to residential university. Sometimes there's a family expectation, which is incredibly strong. At 18, you must start earning. So again, residential university is out. We don't have a university right on the doorstep. So unless there are degree apprenticeships, these people don't have the chance to to study for a degree, they don't have the chance to be everything they can be, and that would be criminal. It'd be criminal in terms of denying them the chance to fulfill all they can do, but also as a country, the contribution that they can make to society, to the economy. We've had um, apprentices go on to become machine learning engineers, marketing automation specialists, uh, accountants. Uh, one is standing for parliament, but you know there's always one that goes bad. And so, unless we had, <laughs> unless you, unless you have these programs in these places, um, we're just cutting off that opportunity. So I'd say, degree apprenticeships are great in a place like London, but they're essential in more peripheral places like North Devon. And what's the, what's the business reaction been? How, how enthusiastic have businesses been? How easy has it been to communicate the message of the benefits, particularly smaller um, firms? Has that, had they been open to receive that message or has that been a bit more of an uphill struggle and has that been addressed? So I, I'm an evangelist uh, for degree apprenticeships and management apprenticeships in particular. So I think uh, uh, anyone in the business community in the Southwest has probably got fed up of uh, hearing me talk about it. Um, People are keen, they're keen to understand how um, this can help with their skills challenges, um, where their concerns are often the complexity. Yeah. Um, and the more that we can simplify it, the more that we can keep things consistent, then the better and the easier that will be. Brilliant, thank you very much. 
Heather, looking at the, the, the social mobility agenda more widely, the inclusivity uh, agenda more widely, you, know, what, you, you advise a lot of businesses um, you know, and you have advised a lot of businesses over the year. What's the first step for an organisation wanting to address their lack of inclusivity, diversity? You know, how do they, one, identify they've got a problem and two, how do they start to put it right? So I think a big part of that is that pipeline of talent coming up. Yeah. And you have to have a pipeline that you can grow. And that pipeline needs to come from all different places. And I really concur with this whole thing around the apprentices being a valuable um, resource that comes into an organisation. They're really um, hungry to learn. Yeah. And they will often work 10 times harder because I know everyone's looking at them. But also... For their families, they might be the first person in their families to actually go on one of these schemes. And so they want to prove to their families they've done well. What I think we've got to do with businesses, we need to educate them into the culture that they understand this is a valuable resource. Yes. Um, I've heard some horror stories where people have gone into a, apprenticeships and they've been told by colleagues that this isn't a really degree, uh, a really important degree. It's not valuable and all of that stuff. We need to stop that behaviour and start to look at the value that the apprentices bring in and how it helps to feed the talent pipeline. And for me, the talent pipeline is an essential part of growing a business. Yeah. Um, we can't have everybody at the top of the tree with no one coming up the tree and we need to look at how do we attract those young school leavers who probably don't know what they want to do and give them an opportunity to study something that might change their mindset about what they can do and then go back to their families many of them will be the only one in their families depending on where you live that will have that opportunity to actually change the economical outcome of their family and I think that's what we're faced with now yeah are you seeing us? Are you, are you sort of witnessing a bit of a sea change from the sort of more superficial approach to this, which is which is just about okay, we'll do this because it's going to make us look good. To actually, this is fundamental to the future of our organisation and our business. We've got to build this pipeline over time, and this has got to be fundamental to what we do. Well, let's just say the big challenge that companies have right now is talent. Mm -hmm. They cannot find enough talent from a different from the different backgrounds that they need to have. And so for me, what I'm actually hearing is how do we attract some of this talent into our organization? And if you're an apprentice, you're earning from day one. And that's an important thing. If you come from a social economic background where finance is really important to the family, to be able to be earning and learning with an outcome of having a bigger job that can change the dynamics of your family is really important. Yeah. And so for me, I think it's how do we attract them in? We need more employers to go into schools and talk about the benefit of doing an, uh, an apprenticeship with them. We need chief execs who have had great employees who have been apprentices to really expose them in a way to talk about them as a role model. So you get rid of that mindset that there is something wrong with you if you've had to go through one of those, those apprenticeships. And, and I just think about what the future looks like over the next couple of years. It is going to be about apprenticeships. Yes. Because more and more 16-year-olds will be thinking, I need to get a job yeah. and I need to earn quickly. And, and it could be that when they're 35, they might decide they want to go to university or do something. Then, But in the meantime, it's learn and earn so that you can contribute. And actually, we all know about the economic situation around finding a home. Mm. Many of the youngsters... I can't see. They'll be living at home till they're 50, actually, before they'll be able to get enough money to save to buy a property. So that earning journey needs to start early and the learning journey needs to be acknowledged that it's an important and critical part of their career trajectory. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Catherine, you've spoken very passionately about the hospitality um, industry. You've spoken to us in the past about the need to um, professionalise careers uh, within hospitality. And are you seeing that professionalisation coming about as a result of the apprenticeship scheme? And, and are you within the argument with some of your, maybe even your competitors in the sector? Yes, I mean, yes. I mean, there's a lot more interest and a lot more um, apprenticeships actually in our sector, I think, than ever before, actually, which is fantastic. Um, I, I would love to get the MBA back. In the, uh, in, the, in the run of opportunities open. Um, I think particularly for our sector, having a gold standard is really, really important to attract people through. 
Um, so that would be my my ask of Gillian. She's gone. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, will. I will. I will definitely because I think again having that sort of shining light to be able to get the pinnacle of the the level of seven uh, MB, MBA. Obviously there are level sevens available, but um, that was a particularly fantastic one for us. Um, I think um, again, I mean, what we see in our business is that the restaurants that have um, apprentices in them. There's a huge halo effect across the whole of the teams. So the managers in those sites are better managers. Um, they think more holistically about training and development, not just their apprentices, but everybody else. Yeah. So the training quality is just better all around. Um, so, you know, we, again, we've, we've done loads of little micro studies in our own business to look at, again, productivity, performance, um, and looking at that, as say, overall performance, not just to the apprentices, but the entire team that they're within. Um, so, again, you know, huge huge advocate for the apprenticeships um, schemes. Yeah, I mean, over 90% of the apprentices that we surveyed last year, 800 or so apprentices, said that they really saw the importance of developing others as a result of having done an apprenticeships thing. So in terms of that continuous, yeah. lifelong learning, Absolutely. professional development, it's critical from a cultural perspective, not just from the individual yeah. training and development perspective. Yeah, and, and it's, it's sort of, um, it's almost infectious. Yeah. So, you know, where we've got um, entry-level apprentices, you, we'll end up persuading the manager to do their chartered. Um, and so you kind of you get just that sort of total interest and understanding about how it works. And, and that's half the battle. It's just people hearing about the opportunities and understanding them. So I totally agree. Sort of getting into schools and colleges and talking to careers advisors and, you know, doing that grassroots stuff so that people actually know what's available is, is just critical. I'm, I'm managing an apprentice at the moment and I feel a constant sense of guilt that I haven't yet done my chart and every time we have the session. So you're absolutely right. I've got four in my team. Oh, right. Well, there we are. Oh, yeah. Four times. Um, James, what, what do you think that government, education providers, professional bodies should be collaborating on more strongly to improve this social mobility story around apprenticeships even further? So I kind of go from a social mobility point of view. I think the thing that is absolutely key to everyone involved in this should be is just about aspiration it's got to be about a huge aspiration this is what you can achieve this is what you can do this is where you can go um, and that's true of any education and i think with that there's kind of two bits from government that we need to be honest with young people and what i mean by honest with young people I think it's really sadly that we're actually sending a lot of young people to university and they're getting appalling value for money for their university experience and they don't get the jobs that they thought they were going to get when they went to university and that's not fair to those young people but sadly the structure is self-perpetuating something that needs to change so that needs to change and the other thing is um this again sounds a bit paradoxical but we kind of need to educate teachers about what an apprenticeship is and why it's a benefit to the young person because many of them just don't know they don't and again brilliant teachers out there but if you've been to university then you've gone into the teaching profession you actually don't know about the world of work and how can you tell a young person that maybe university there's a different way actually and so we need to educate teachers and schools about the alternatives out there but as i say underpinning has got a aspiration <laughs> and kind of the potential that everyone has brilliant thank you james sure um for the last decade, you've run uh, a tech business, but you're about to go into the university um, sector. I hope we're not breaking any confidences there. It's all out in, in, in the open. You're going into Exeter University as Deputy Vice Chancellor. Um, do you think universities focus enough on degree apprenticeships? Of course, Exeter does, but the universities in general. Uh, universities don't come close to putting enough uh, attention to <coughs> the apprenticeships at the moment. There are some honourable exceptions. Coventry uh, does a lot of work. Exeter has... Uh, more degree apprentices than any other Russell Group at uh, uni and has looked to growing that very strongly. But out of 24 Russell Group universities, only five currently offer degree apprenticeships. Mm. I haven't checked, but I'm sure that every one of them in their vision, vision and values and so forth talks about social justice being at the core of what they do. You don't get to say that social justice is at the core of what you do if you are denying opportunity to every single person for whom a residential place is not a viable option. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, look, I think we're coming to the end of our, of our um, uh, wise, informed and inspiring conversation. I think on that, taking that final message, 
it's a message for um, business as well as education providers and HE and so on um, that it's necessary to walk the walk as well as talk the talk on social mobility and apprenticeships are a critical mechanism of doing that. And with that, um, I'm going to draw the panel to the close. A huge thank you to the panel. And please join me in giving uh, Heather, Catherine, James and Stuart a round of applause. And now I'm delighted to welcome Anne Franca back to the stage for our final session of the evening. Anne. Thank you, Anthony. And whilst I introduce our next and final super special guest, um, they're going to magic away, I think, the chairs. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure uh, to welcome now, please, um, to uh, this wonderful event, our gold medal winner of 2022, Dame Sharon White. Sharon became the John Lewis Partnership's sixth chairman in February 2020. Before this, she spent a number of years in the public sector, including roles at the Treasury, the World Bank, and the Prime Minister's Policy Unit, and prior to her current role, was Chief Executive of Ofcom, the UK's communications regulator. Um, this inspirational career has been recognized not only by the 2022 CMI Gold Medal, but also she um, was recognized in the New Year's Honours List for her dedication to public service. And she's also very recently been named Britain's most influential black person in the Power List 2023. Dame Sharon, welcome. Lovely to see you and thank you so much for joining us. Very, um, it's brilliant to uh, <laughs> I managed to slip in early, so it's great actually just to um, sort of be incredibly inspired by both the apprentices but then also the employer panel. So it's great to see you. Thank you oh, so much brilliant. for inviting me tonight. And well, I'm so glad you could make it. And you saw you had one of your wonderful apprentices. Yeah, so Julia. Julia. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, which is a great story. But um Tell me, what do you think, what's the role of apprenticeships for you um, in training the workforce of the future? And, you know, where does it fit in for you in that training menu? Yeah, so big question. I um, was very struck by Heather's comment in the previous, um, previous panel, which was obviously sort of linking rightly apprentices and um, apprenticeships and social mobility. And we use these very big terms, but it's really about how everybody can can get held. And obviously, some of you will know the, the John Lewis partnership is, as I said, is this sort of extraordinary and very um, particular background, in that it was basically set up as a as an engine for social mobility, um, with the idea that essentially you'd have a business that almost provides the sorts of benefits and opportunities, um, almost like the welfare state before the welfare state was set up. So for us, apprenticeships are the most fantastic sort of modern um, route by which we can really support everybody to move from being a um, brilliant shop assistant when you go into Waitrose or uh, John Lewis um, uh, at the checkout, right the way through to being a branch manager or then, you know, becoming a buyer or some of the more sort of senior, senior roles. So we've got about three and a half thousand apprentices since um, 2016 and they are absolutely core cool, um, to, to, our, to our pipeline of talent. That's great to see and you mentioned um, social mobility and um, we looked at that as part of our Everyone Economy research uh, last um, year for our 75th anniversary and, um, and actually we found it's really important for organizations to do this, but there's quite a big say-do gap. A lot of them say they do stuff for social mobility, but they don't actually do do stuff for social mobility, and they don't really have any for recruitment programs, et cetera. Um, why do you think um, that's important that we focus, that businesses focus on social um, economic mobility, and how best do they do that? Um, so we've just been talking about hospitality being a sort of amazing sector for um, 
uh, for 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 kind of progression of mobility. And I think retail is the other mm-hmm. sort of enormously important um, sector. We're the biggest employer of any across the country, and it is an area where you can come in with no qualifications and um, you know move from working in a supermarket and working your way up. So I think. For, certainly for my business, social mobility is absolutely kind of endemic and core to what we are um, what we are trying to do. I think it's also when we talk about inclusion, it's the kind of class is the last sort of frontier. And, um, you know, we, in the current context that we've just been talking about, the biggest cost of living crisis um, since the 1970s, there's a macroeconomy um, background, which is probably as adverse as any of us have known since, you know, the financial crisis. So how do we ensure that our young people who have got fewer networks um, have got fewer opportunities in those sort of soft areas have got just the same opportunities as um, those who are better connected. So it's, it's a moral right, but it's also um, a very, very strong sort of business um, exigency too. Yes. And you were you said uh, I'm struck by this term that John Lewis was set up as the original social yeah. mobility engine and and how does that reflect in for example your recruitment practices you know how do you tap into those talent pools um, that you might not otherwise tap into and 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 do apprenticeships play a role in that yeah so I mean some of you will I mean Judy you've had a great example we have got um, now a very particular focus on young people leaving the care system. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've been thinking about where do we, where can we kind of really add value? Where can we really add the weight of the of the of the brand in terms of employment? And everybody will know young people in the care system three times as likely, three four times as likely to be um, out of any kind of economic activity, even as compared to your other young people, more likely to be homeless um, than to be at university. And so we are really trying to sort of focus. Um, our efforts on this very um, sort of incredibly fractured but also very under-discussed group. So we've set up um, an apprenticeship programme specifically for young people coming out of the care system. We were, it's a shame, um, I mean, Gillian, who I think is, um, is already making a huge impact, but the, 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 the announcement last week, the response to the um, McAllister report for, for care leavers, the fact that if you're an apprenticeship, apprentice coming from the care system, you're now getting double the um, amount of support, double the amount of levy. So in our own, in our own small way, we are really trying to focus on probably the most um, economically and socially and almost emotionally sort of disadvantaged group ooh, through, our, um, through, our, through our apprenticeship programme. I think that's great. And of course, we all know and we're inspired by... Um, uh, your wonderful uh, Christmas ad, um, again featuring the, the the skateboarding father who was taking in um, uh, the the young person who was in a care home. Why do you think it's so important for business to focus on social purpose? And you know what role does that play for you? For what should businesses be doing? Yeah, I mean it's um, I mean it is fascinating because there's now no business that doesn't talk about purpose, and I think. Um, which, I, which I think is an enormous positive, something that's become obviously much more attenuated um, through COVID when businesses, all of us, have just been sort of reappraising what matters in life? Who do I want to work for? What kind of work-life balance do I want? You know, who do I want to shop with? Where do I want to put my money? What's What's really important between... Um, consuming today and ensuring that the planet is safe tomorrow. And so all of those issues, I think, have just become a, 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 a sort of tremendous crescendo. And, um, and certainly for us, we know that um, the people are much more likely to um, shop with, to want to work with businesses that kind of stand for something. Mm-hmm. And you know, certainly over the last couple of years when I've been doing recruitment, we've just done a kind of big revamped purpose in the partnership around kind of happiness and um happiness happiness but that's why it was founded right happiness happiness working in partnership for a happy world and um you know many of the which is now kind of at the front of all our recruitment and many of the 
um, you know, people I've talked to, partners coming into the partnership have said, actually, the first thing we did was to Google purpose. Because we what kind of, you know, whether we're coming in for an entry level job or, you know, uh, um, you know, more senior in your career. Actually, we want to figure out whether my values as a person align with the values of this company. And so I think it's not a sort of, it's not a nice to have. I think you cannot be a business that's going to be commercially successful, but also to have, um, you know, to hire and retain brilliant people, um, unless you stand for something that's more than about making money. And for us constitutionally, you know, our job is to make enough money, sufficient profit to to fulfill our purpose. Now, it has to be said we're not making enough money at the moment because, <laughs> you know, the macro situation has been has been super tough. But sure. um, yeah, we've, we've got a very different balance as a business between profit and purpose. Well, and, you know, that is proven. I know um, CMI's own research and I know that John Lewis has uh, Spadan Lewis, I think, was founded on this. Happier people are more productive, right? And and your your point, you said um, businesses need to um, make sure that the that their values and align with the personal values of their employees, and employees want their personal values to align with the business, and that's been proven to lead to better results, actually. So. There's a purpose to purpose. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, as I say, I mean, I find this sort of debate slightly, slightly a non-debate. Um, <laughs> you know, there's been lots of criticism about sort of, you know, so-called woke kind of capitalism, which I kind of think about as common sense capitalism. It's not a choice. You know, you cannot, you cannot be operating in business without having a clear, a clear purpose. I mean, fascinating this week with um with bp announcing um record results which is you know which is great for them and all the debate has been about actually where is the company in relation to its climate change targets and there's no company in whatever sector you are you know business is 50 percent of the economy what are we doing to improve social impact what are we doing to ensure that we're still here as a as a, a planet. as a planet <laughs> it's it it is i think it is something that is becoming more top of mind and interestingly and i think rightly what you're saying is businesses are going to be held more to account um and if they do just make profits that seem at odds with their purpose then that's going to get called out not only perhaps by the media but what i think you're saying is by their own employees um and by their future employees yeah i yeah, completely. I think it's um, and their customers. I th I think it's just a, a a necessity of doing great business. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, and again, you know, you have been at the forefront of that, and I think that um, uh, that is an incredibly important point. And the 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 big thing is, which is what you're saying, is it's not a debate. It's common sense capitalism. It's right. It's common sense capitalism. Brilliant. I love that line. Um, I'm going to turn slightly now to um, uh, this event is a little bit early for International Women's Day, but it is next month and you're obviously a very high profile uh, female business leader, um, um, also a, 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 a black business leader. Um, what is expected of you? What expectations maybe do you put on yourself? Um, and how do you approach being a role model, which obviously you are to so many? Um, I mean, I always find it very difficult to know how to respond. <laughs> um, because on the on the one hand, I have been sort of extraordinarily lucky because I've had this a very bizarre career of um, lots of lots of different roles in the in the public sector, then a regulator now uh, in business, and feeling you know, unbelievably uh privileged um at the same time i never think about myself as um a role model and even the fact that it's a debate feels to me as though we've still got so much progress to make because it's you know i shouldn't be unusual um it's you know it there shouldn't be a sort of moniker which is a female business leader or a black person doing a role 
And I think, um, I mean, what I get excited by is that there'll be a point at which this is not remarkable or indeed remarked on, because actually we're just all um, doing a great job regardless of background. Indeed, our background is an advantage to the roles that we are that we are doing. So I, um, I, um, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to a day when, um, <laughs> you know, maybe for my kids, um, that it's it's just not it's just not an issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not talked about. But we were earlier today. We were um, talking with a number of people and with the Countess of Wessex around what progress are we really making, mm -hmm. um, whether it's gender equality or whether it's um, um, you know, uh, uh, more ethnically diverse business leaders um, um, or uh, people from uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the reality is we're not going fast enough, right? So I know, I hear you. you, you know, you are looking forward for the day when that's not an issue because it, you just are a leader, and, but we're still some way away from that. Um, in fact, you know, it's headline news when one FTSE 100 company yeah. has a female chair, a female CEO, yeah. and a female yes. CFO. Seven, seven trends. Right? It's, nice. um, so it's a big thing. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do to make more progress so that it isn't um, exceptional in your view? What should we be doing? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I always think from a sort of very personal point of view, the most, so the most important thing I can do is to run a great business really well because then that success and the success of your people and the success of your teams um, uh, kind of speaks for itself and it's part of the kind of normalization of women being in roles where it hasn't been normal. I think events like this, I think what the CMI is doing is fantastically important. So I'm part of a kind of informal um, network of female CEOs and we kind of basically meet to laugh and cry every sort of two or three months. Um, uh, women from the banking sector, some women from the media, retail. And actually that group and some of us have been, uh, some of them have been incredibly successful. Others have been in a really, have had a very, very difficult time over the last 18 months. And there is something about the sort of the solidarity and creating networks where you're not necessarily part of the mainstream, which is both shoring, shoring you up, but also the debates we have about talent that's coming through, the, the people that we're spotting, um, but also how you buoy up, um, particularly women in very high profile jobs where um, it has to be said, some of the kind of external commentary can be um, uh, rather rather different as compared to your male counterparts. So I think doing your job brilliantly, I think um, the networks and the work of CMI, but I think women supporting other women is um, is incredibly important. Absolutely. So uh, making and also making sure not not only that peer support, but extending down the ladder and pulling others up and. Um, um, and, and actually, I want to um, ask you this. We're going to take some audience questions as well. But uh, this came up earlier in our discussion. I'd love to know your views on this. So we were talking about the new world of hybrid working. Um, and there are businesses, and yours is one, where you do have people that can work in a hybrid manner. But equally, you have people that actually mm -hmm. have to go into the shops to serve the customers. Um, so how do you approach this and what are your, what have you found post pandemic? Because then some people are concerned, well, it's, it's mostly the, the senior men that are saying back in the office all the time, but others may not want to. And what about those that can't work remotely? So what are your thoughts on this new hybrid world? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, I mean, I talk to lots of business people who kind of privately say, gosh, I just want everybody to back, be back in the office five days a week so I can see where they are and kind of measure their productivity. That's not where we are. Obviously, you know, we have 80,000 partners of whom, you know, the vast majority are working in shops and distribution centres and warehouses. So it's not... Um, they, there's less flexibility, but we're still trying to induce enough flexibility so that, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to work school hours and pick up your kids, we try to be as accommodating as we can. And then those who are um, in, we don't call it head office, but our sort of central teams, um, we're continuing to be very positive about hybrid working. And 
I think like lots of other businesses, we've sort of settled it about three days a week and Monday and Fridays are like a ghost town in the office, but, um, you know, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays are, are vibrant. And I think, I think it's a real positive because I think, again, when it comes to inclusion, when it comes to a game, particularly for women, but, but men too, who've got caring responsibilities who might have uh, needed to pause their career or pause the sorts of jobs uh, they might have done in the past, actually being able to do the school run or to you know look after parents mm -hmm. um, a couple of days a week or to be able to afford a house that's not in central London I think I'm really positive I think those are fantastic opportunities so I am you know I'm not somebody who's sort of desperately looking to return to pre-pandemic ways of work and I think it's a it's a real really positive and very progressive Yes, well, we certainly agree with you, and there is evidence to suggest that that is the case, that actually productivity does improve. Um, and what do you make, because this came up today as well, of the organizations that do, you know, use technology to spy on their remote workers, like, you know, how many times their fingers hit the keypads? So, so our technology at the partnership is probably so antiquated with the <laughs> idea that we'd ever be able to... I mean, it's just bizarre. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think we would agree with you, but there are employers out there that are doing it. And and by the way, the uh, you know people always find ways around these things. They just put their apparently they put their coffee mug on the keyboard, so it looks like they're <laughs> always pressing the key. Um, <laughs> so that so we won't be we won't be seeing that at John. I, 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 I don't I don't think I suspect they're not going to hang on to their employees for very uh, for for too long. Yeah, no, I'm I'm sure you're probably right on that. Um, but you don't. You said most people are back Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. But you, as the as the, the chair, the boss, do you set a rule? Like yeah. everybody has to do yeah. this. So it's a, for partnership. Partnership's not a very rule set rule setting <laughs> business. Um, so we've said hybrid. We've said flexibility, and it's for every local team to decide. And as I say, broadly speaking, we've kind of we've kind of ended up with a very sort of um, peaky um, middle of the week. And it, I think it's generally working well. Okay, so you devolve that to the line manager, which is another thing that we heard today that that's very important. Yeah. So if you're, you know, if you're in a creative team, I and mean, we're just um, looking at our autumn collections, for example, in John Lewis. Um, autumn collections for this year. Actually, you want to be in with your team and feeling the products and the materials. Um, but actually, people are doing trading meetings online on Mondays. And so I think, you know, we we hire lots of brilliant people. So we trust them uh, to figure out a routine that's going to work brilliantly for them. Mm -hmm. And well, it's good that you don't do edicts. We were talking earlier that um, they usually don't work. And there have been a number of CEOs that have said, everybody back to the office and the uh, people working there have said nah. i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then they have to back off so by devolving that and by not issuing you said it's not a very edict based um uh, uh organization and we know that but uh, it, so that's not you you would agree that that's not a particularly effective strategy well i mean i'm sort of i've been kind of fascinated to see particularly some of the i guess some of the tech companies you've got very big differences facebook where um actually they've been very internationally mobile you've got other companies apple and so on the american banks as you say every company that has tried to get people back full-time five days a week I think you're just you're just going to see talent loss. Yeah, I, I think I think um, certainly we agree with you, and 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 that's what employees tell us as well, and I think that's what managers tell us as well, people, right? People want the choice. Yeah, they do want the choice, so it's hard to put that genie back in the bottle. Um, so, okay, we are going to take some audience questions, um, but before we do, uh, I would like your thoughts. We've been talking a lot about skills. Mm -hmm and the, um, the role of, for example, apprenticeships and skills. Um, but as an employer, what do you think we need to do? It's a shame Jillian's gone, but never mind. We'll tell her what you said. Um, uh, what do you think we need to do to improve skills? What should employers do? What would you like to see the government and, and the schools do? What's your recipe for success? Yeah, I mean, for I, growth? Yeah, I mean, I tend to be sort of very... Um, it's a shame Julian's not here. I mean, I'm uh, 
quite down on how the school system, even for kids who are pretty academic, um, is both far too narrow in the UK, but also has become, um, you know, I look at I look at my, you know, I've got kids doing sort of A levels and GCSEs this year, and it's as though time has frozen since I was at school. It's a the, the idea that you're building up skills to work in teams, the soft skills, which I agree shouldn't be seen as a sort of in a derogatory way. It's a very, very tick box, very, very narrow um, curriculum still. That's, um, as I say, even for the kids who are going down a, a very kind of narrow uh, academic route, isn't, isn't providing um, the fruit and the skills to, to be ready at the world of work. Mm -hmm. And so, Personally, I think we we need fundamental reform of the school's system that's more vocationally based, more based on how we uh, use digital skills, and certainly more based on how we how we interrelate from a from a kind of soft skill team basis. Yeah, well, it's interesting because the countess earlier said fundamentally she believes that the role of education is to find everybody a job that they're happy with, that they can be productive in, and that gives them opportunity. It sounds like you're sort of agreeing. I'm kind of there. Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I think, um, I think so many really talented children are put off and have their confidence undermined by the narrowness and the rigidity of the school system. And I think that's a, I mean, it's why degree apprenticeships are so fantastic because it's partly acting as such an enormous corrective to some of the deficiencies within our school system. Yes, you're right. And I know at CMI, we did some work that shows that a lot of graduates don't have those soft skills, university graduates, which, which you know, we're trying to correct. Do you see that as an employer? Sometimes you have to train them in these soft skills? Yeah, no, I mean, very, very much so. So for us, um, I mean, we're almost providing a kind of, like I'm sure lots of businesses are kind of quasi-school um, Re, kind of re-education for lots of lots of kids who either didn't get on with the school system or the school system just has not provided them with um, all the skills they need to do a structured job that's that's very closely related, related to other people. Yeah, no, I, well, we couldn't agree more at CMI. We know that those interpersonal skills are vital. Actually, they're, uh, they account for, um, according to the experts, and uh, about half the UK's productivity gap is down to management and leadership skills. And you're saying that, that you kind of agree with that. And at the moment you think the employer is left holding that burden when actually you think that the educational system should absorb I more. I think there's a, there's a closer partnership to be made with a more flexible education system. Yeah, and we completely agree with that. Um, well, now, thank you. We are going to have time for some questions. I believe we've been taking questions remotely and from um, the audience, I'm going to turn to my colleagues who are going to produce said questions. Sure, indeed. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anne. Um, the first question, uh, we've brought some of the ones that came on uh, virtually and from people in the room. So uh, the first one's from Janet Rowson. How can apprenticeship employers and providers get more women engaging with digital and engineering apprenticeships? Oh, this is a brilliant question. Um, so we, I mean, I'm sure like lots of businesses, we have um, found it really difficult to recruit for um, data and analytical skills. So we've set up our own um, apprenticeship for those skills. So we've got, um, you know, partners who've been on the shop floor who are now retraining as uh, data analysts, data specialists. And so I think my encouragement would be maybe we can join up um, to connect with some other businesses who are interested in this. But I think taking that creativity to design um, your own program uh, where, where the market is, 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 is very difficult, but we found it's been hugely, hugely positive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we've had a question from Sally Penny uh, asking, what effect do you see the cost of living crisis having on social mobility? Will social mobility become a nice to have during an economic downturn, or do you see companies like John Lewis Partnership carrying on the momentum? Um, it's another great question. So, um, 
I, I mean, I'm probably more worried by the macro, um, the kind of economic situation than I have been for a very long time. And I think, although a lot of the debate at the moment is that inflation's falling, actually we know that for um, lots of families and people who are already struggling, um, um, some things are going to get harder. Energy bills, because of what's happening with the price cap, for example, due to increase by another twenty percent. So for so for so for families who are from um, less uh, advantaged backgrounds, it's going to feel it's going to feel really tough. I guess the question is whether businesses who have been um, supporting um, uh, um, kind of progression and social mobility will will feel that's a sort of nice to have and and um, and and cut back. Certainly, from the John Lewis Partnership, we we will continue to be as um, you know, focused as we've as we've been over the last few years, it, particularly as I say, with this sort of initiative for young people leaving the care system. At the same time, every business is, is going to be restructuring, and there are going to be some very, I'm sure, very difficult decisions because every business has got to get their costs down. So the question is, how do we ensure that as we restructure to, you know, retain our sort of commercial um, viability and commercial success, we're still doing those great things that are purpose-led, that are pro-social mobility, which is both getting the talent through, but also connecting with our customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question, James Stewart, who was asking, how do you make apprenticeships more accessible to minority, minority ethnic community, communities where they just don't see apprentices, apprenticeships um, on the same par as a university degree in particular? How do you, how do you reach those people with the message yeah, about apprenticeships? Another, another great question. I think um, it's probably a particularly acute for, um, for people from minority backgrounds, but I think there's still a broader issue, even with degree apprenticeships, that there's, there's still not um, parity mm -hmm. or there's still not apparent parity with um, a kind of classic mainstream degree. I mean, as we've seen today with the previous panel, there are so much of this is having role models. I mean, I thought your story is fantastic. I, don't want to, I didn't want to go to university at 18, but look at the story you now have. And I think finding ways where um, uh, people who've been incredibly successful having done a degree apprenticeship can then go back into schools and communities and kind of really proselytize and evangelize, I suspect as much to the parents <laughs> as to the um as to the um as to the students i mean my younger son who is um thinking about doing a degree apprenticeship himself and actually he's you know trying to get information from the schools has been they, they just it's just not something that they are yet um really clear about so i think julian talking about yeah. the fact that um uh, UCAS will start to have some of this information readily available. But I think those who've, who've been incredibly successful go back into the community, go back into schools and, you know, explain that you're doing brilliantly better than some of your peers who've been who've been to straight university. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, Paige sort of comparing her progress with her friends who did yeah. the university yes. without the apprenticeship. Um, and I think that's a really important point. Um, and, and you're right. Now, Gillian uh, did tell us UCAS is going to list all apprenticeships. So, so bravo. But what you're saying is career centers in schools need to encourage kids. And Paige was saying that her school thought she was crazy. I think that's the word you used, Paige. <laughs> um, so we have some way to go on that. Perfect. Uh, Philippa Jones how do you support more women into senior management posts? There are still very few women in senior or executive roles across all sectors. Yeah, so firstly, you have to start trying to get your own house in order. Um, so our board is majority female, our ex-co is majority female, um, and indeed the business is majority female. Um, uh, and if we've got about 50-50 in our leadership roles. We do much less well in terms of um, ethnicity, and that's the kind of next kind of big um, area for us to make huge progress. So firstly, doing everything we can within within our business, but then also how how we then you know properly connecting with with other businesses where 
yes, there's been huge progress, but it's been huge progress mostly at non-executive level and not at exec level. So as you say, uh, uh, the number of chief executives, the number of CFOs, the number of exec positions on boards is still really, really low. And I think um, uh, I think the sort of engagement with shareholders and investors and, you know, getting the data available that um, female-led businesses are are doing really well commercially, but also engaging with their customers and creating mm. lifetime value for customers in a way that's incredibly strong and um, and incredibly positive. So more to do, mm. more to do, but recognize the progress um, even over the last sort of 10, 15 years too. Thanks very much. The next one's from Jerry Afor and it's very, very timely. Um, what do you think is the way forward for apprenticeship programs uh, in organizations that are increasingly fast paced um, and one's under pressure? And he notes the NHS where staff are under so much pressure. How do they find the time to mentor and develop apprentices? Yeah, and it's and it's and it's tough. I don't think there's a I don't know if you're in the audience, I don't think there's a, there's a straightforward um answer to that. So whether you're in the public sector at the moment under huge pressure. Um, with everything that's happened over the last two years, whether you're in um, business, which again, many, many businesses now massively restructuring, but I think um, the best led enterprises, be they public or private, as Anne was saying, you're constantly focused on talent. And so if you're not prioritizing skills, if you're not prioritizing and those who are coming through the organization, if you're not prioritizing the coaching and the mentoring, you're going to find in two, three years time that, that you're in a really, really very difficult and very dark place. So although it feels like a very trite thing to say, actually, you've got to prioritize, actually, you've got to prioritize. And you'll find that, you know, the best execs are spending 50% of their time on talent, on their leadership, on on seeking new talent into the organisation. So I think we've just got to um, keep relentlessly focused on this. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rachel Oddy asks, how can we encourage employers to value the off the job training aspect of apprenticeships, uh, especially management apprentices? Yes, that's a, <laughs> it's always a hard one when they, you know, when you don't see the for, for a manager who doesn't necessarily see the sort of direct benefits. I think um, certainly we have um, hugely valued when um, the off the job training, when, when our partners come back, actually you can really see the difference. And so I think it's really about how do we also train our managers to take a much more kind of holistic and rounded view. So you might not see the benefit yourself directly, but actually for the organization in terms of retention, later progression, it's really critical. Um, so I do think it's about how we also try to train our managers and train our leaders to look at skills in a, in a much broader and, and longer term fashion. So it's one of the things you just said about good leaders spend half their time on talent. And that means actually encouraging your team to go on training right? And then encouraging them to apply it when they return, right? Exactly. You know, so integrate it into what you're doing instead of, you know, oh, you went on that one day course, now get back to work. And I also think, you know, the easiest thing when, when times are tough is to cut the training budget. And the worst thing to do when times are tough is to cut your training budget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a, you know, it takes you forever to recover from that. Mm, good point. I think we have time for one more just because it's a really good one. <laughs> um, this one comes from uh, Andrea Littlewood. What best piece of advice have you received and um, how have you implemented it in your career? Best piece of advice I've received was probably um, kind of to, to follow your instincts and to have fun. Ooh. So I am, um, I mean, I'm the worst person in terms of giving career advice because um, I always think what's the most, you know, we, it's a long life. And, um, and we've all in this room got so many opportunities and so many choices to, um, I don't know, to do, to do good, to make a difference. 
but also um, having fun and being able to get out of bed every morning and think, actually, I'm working with a great team of people. Um, uh, we're doing great work together, but actually it's a really congenial work atmosphere. So probably the people who advise me to kind of, you know, go down particular career paths um, have been less useful than actually just have fun. And probably the other thing is always, always be careful who you work for. So in the days before I became chairman, that, that relationship you have with your people manager, your line manager, um, so, so, so critical. And certainly during the period of my career when I had um, very young children, um, that relationship was really, really critical, working with somebody who was um, kind of super progressive and super flexible made a made a huge difference but yeah definitely have fun has probably been the piece of advice that has has stuck with me all these years so that's quite amazing um you ended with a huge plug for cmi which is uh it's all about your line manager and uh, we are about <laughs> building better line managers who understand how to let people follow their instincts have fun develop them into tomorrow's leaders um, Dame Sharon, thank you so much. Our time is up. Um, join me, please, in a warm round of applause. Thank you. And with that, we'll draw the evening, uh, the formal part of the evening, to a close. Um, it, it only remains uh, upon me to thank Dame Sharon, also all our previous panelists, amazing apprentices, fabulous employers. Of course, the Countess and the Secretary of State, Gillian Keegan, will give her your messages, don't you worry. Um, and, uh, and all of you, and I'd like to also say a special thanks to all of my CMI colleagues, our fabulous events team, Joe and her team who have made today possible, Anthony and the policy team for all the research and the preparation, and to um, all of our wonderful uh, bursary students as well that joined us. So please do stay if you can. We have food and drink. Um, and uh, thank you again for joining us for what I hope has been a really interesting celebration of uh, apprentices and their impact during Apprenticeship Week. Thank you. Thank you.